today's lecture we continue the introduction to the basic ideas in manufacturing systems management and we also try and introduce the basic ideas behind cellular manufacturing. In the previous lecture we saw what the requirements of manufacturing are and we also saw the need for manufacturing systems to orient themselves to meet these requirements. So, we start with a very quick recap of the requirements of manufacturing. So, make an increasing variety of products on shorter lead times with small runs and flawless quality. Improve return on investment by automating and introducing new technology in processes and materials. So, that price can be reduced to meet local and foreign competition. Mechanize, keep schedules flexible, keep inventories low, keep capital cost minimum and keep the workforce contented. So, this is the definition of the requirements of manufacturing given by Skinner about 26 years ago. Now, we also looked at these requirements in the context of the background with which we started this course meeting customer expectations. So, to make an increasing variety because the customer wants variety, shorter lead times so that newer products can be introduced and more variety can be introduced. Shorter lead times would imply smaller runs and flawless quality implies that all customer expectations are met. We also define quality as the ability to meet the stated and implied needs of customer. Many times in the context of manufacturing the needs are stated and in the context of service some of the needs are implied. So, a very general definition is to meet the stated and the implied needs of the customer, but in the context of this course we would say to meet the stated requirements of the customer in a, in a flawless manner which means no defects and to be able to delight the customer with the quality. Now, use automation so that the speed of manufacture can be increased. Use automation so that the variation can come down. Introduce new technology in process and materials primarily with the objective of reducing the price. So, customer wants the product to be price less, so reduce price and see what are all the ways by which the price can be reduced. If it requires that new technologies have to be introduced in materials do that, so that the price can be reduced. Manufacturing should also gear up to meet local and foreign competition, something that we saw in the earlier lecture. Mechanize, keep schedules flexible, schedules have to be flexible to meet the uncertainty in demand, to meet the variation in demand, to meet fluctuations in demand, to take care of other unfore unforeseen circumstances, which could be material not available, machine not available and so on. So, schedules have to be flexible, inventories have to be low. Uh, most manufacturing companies today talk of zero inventories or having very minimal inventories, keep capital costs minimum and keep the workforce contented. Now, manufacturing systems have to try and meet these requirements and before we get into how they have tried to do that, let us try and look at one aspect which is the ninth law which we described, where combining, simplifying and eliminating can save time, money and effort, which means the basic idea of this law is to keep it simple and do not complicate it. So, manufacturing systems have tried very simple approaches, but very effective approaches sequentially and systematically one over the other, so that these requirements can be met. So, we look at another graph or a slide here, which talks about the various types of production systems or manufacturing systems and how they are classified. If you see this, the x axis is volume and y axis is variety. So, the x axis represents the volume of production, y axis represents variety of production. This is also called the volume variety graph. Now, if you see carefully, there are three big areas in this graph, the one in the middle which is called batch production, the one to its left which is called job shop 
and one to its right and below which is called mass production. You also have two other classifications which are little small you can see a P here which stands for projects and you can also see a C here at the end which stands for continuous productions. The batch production systems represent the middle volume middle variety manufacturing and as the volume increases the variety comes down we have high volume low variety systems which are called mass production systems and when the volume increases further we have what are called continuous production systems. As the volume comes down the variety increases, so low volume high variety manufacturing is called the job shop and still lower volume and very high variety are called projects. In addition the layout also depends on the type of manufacturing system. Now for the continuous and mass production systems uh, we have the product layout where the machines are arranged according to the requirements of the product. For batch manufacturing systems we have the process layout where there is functional specialization or process specialization where machines are arranged depending on the processes that they perform. Some of the job shops also have a process centric specialization. Now in the area marked P where we look at projects there we also have something called a fixed position layout. Particularly in situations where we manufacture very large bulky products or sometimes man we manufacture very fragile products we use the fixed position layout where the people and the equipment are brought to the place or the site where the product is made. The example is shipbuilding where all the material people and machines are brought to the place where the product is made or assembled. Now, several examples can be given for each one of them. The projects type manufacturing would be uh, making for example in the areas of shipbuilding uh, aeroplanes and so on where we have a lot of variety coming in and every time a new batch is made or a new set of products are made the product specifications change change and the variety increases. Now the job shop is essentially a small shop which can handle job orders as they come. So there you can ex expect the volume to be smaller and the variety to be larger. Batch production systems are essentially where we have a lot of assemblies. So we have middle volume middle variety manufacturing which you could see in, in uh, automobile industry in machinery manufacturing and certain other areas. So if you move towards mass production then you could have products which involve uh, less of an assembly or would involve smaller components coming into the assembly. So the volume can go up and the variety will come down to result in mass production. Continuous production could mean uh, very high volume for example you make a single chemical and so on. We also observe that from this graph as well as from data that a very large proportion of manufacturing happens in the batch manufacturing context where we do middle volume middle variety manufacturing. Many times the product is assembled out of a lot of components a majority of these components are bought out and a small number of these components are manufactured but still the number of components and parts that are manufactured is large enough to separate to have separate lines for each therefore batch production systems are use what is called as a process layout or a functional layout. Incidentally the type of layout also changes with the type of the, the manufacturing. So very large the three broad classifications of layout are called process layout, product layout and we also have uh, the layout where the product is static and the processes are brought inside towards the product fixed position layout as they are called. Now, but we concentrate on two important types of layouts which is called the process or functional layout for batch manufacturing and product or line layout for mass and continuous type of manufacturing. 
So, each of these production systems have an associated kind of a layout which have been used traditionally. Now, in this layout which is called line layout, we have a production line for each of the uh, products that are being made. So, this layout is called product layout or line layout, where there is a line for each product that is made, which means each line will have machines in the order in which the product visits the machine. So, since the volume is uh, the variety is very small which means very few number of products are being made with very large volume, it is possible to have a separate line for each of the product. So, this line layout is a very efficient way of carrying out mass production, where we have dedicated machines in each line and each line handles one or sometimes more than one product but the variety is small and the volume is large. Now, when we have these batch manufacturing systems, they use what is called a process layout or a functional layout, which concentrates on what is called functional specialization or departmental specialization. So, the manufacturing system or the layout is divided into several areas, where each area is specialized in a certain function where certain types of machines, similar machines, similar in terms of functions are kept. For example, one could think in terms of a lathe shop, where there are lot of lathe, lathes that are kept here. One could think in terms of a drilling area, where a set of drilling machines are kept here. So, that is called functional specialization or departmental specialization. So, in the batch manufacturing system, the products depending on the route will move from one of these functional areas to another and all the manufacturing is carried out and the final product comes out. Little later we will show a schematic diagram as to how a functional layout works. Now, this diagram helps us in classifying the manufacturing systems primarily into batch, mass and job and in this course we, we most of the times we will be looking at the batch production systems and how to make them more efficient. And we also understand that the batch production systems have what is called process layout or functional layout. Right. So, now from coming back from the requirements of manufacturing to the various methodologies and approaches that manufacturing systems have used over a period of time. So, the next few slides I am going to classify the methodologies into many the first thing will be called methodologies based on traditional approaches, then comes the changes. So, you would find methodologies based on process improvement, you would find methodologies based on human resources and processes, you would find methodologies based on information systems and decisions and you would find methodologies which talk about an overall business perspective. So, we will talk about each of these methodologies in some detail before we introduce cellular manufacturing which is one of the main areas that we are going to look at in this course. So, what I had explained to you in the last few minutes is what is highlighted in this slide. Now, this slide talks about the line layout or product layout as well as the process layout. For example, I just mentioned that line layout or product layout is used in this area that is for high volume low variety manufacturing, while the process layout is used in this area which is middle volume, middle variety manufacturing. Nearly 70 to 80 percent of manufacturing happens in this area and that is one of the reasons why this area is shown bigger than the other areas in this figure. So, traditionally manufacturing systems operated using the line layout or product layout for continuous or high volume production systems and as I had mentioned each product would have a separate line depending on the volume, two or three products would have the same line, some of the products would skip some of the machines, but we would have unidirectional flow and the machines are laid out in a manner that the product can enter continue processing in the same direction and the finished product comes out. We also have process layout, which was there for batch production for middle volume, middle variety 
and the focus was more on utilization of the resources in the process type layout. Quality was largely based on conformance to specifications, quality was the focus was more on measurement and tools of statistical quality control. So, percentage rejects etcetera were measured and there was constant monitoring to see whether the quality of the product conformed to specifications. In the traditional approaches there was not so much emphasis on quality with respect to the customer rather than with respect to measurement and conformance to the specifications laid down by the customer. So, the quality aspects were largely confined to methods of statistical quality control, process control, measurement and so on. Now, we move to three important aspects of process improvement as I have listed here. Now, this classification I have made based on my own observation and based on the way I have understood how improvements have happened in manufacturing systems. So, there could be many more areas in the process improvement, but we restrict ourselves to these three under this heading. Now, these three are group technology or cellular manufacturing, just in time manufacturing which can also be called as Japanese management systems, because they originated from Japan and flexible manufacturing. Now, in, in a sense this slide captures nearly 70 percent of this course and whatever is shown in this slide will be expanded to about 70 percent of this course. So, as manufacturing systems started understanding their requirements, they also started looking at what are the pitfalls or limitations of the batch manufacturing. Traditionally batch manufacturing had the process layout, so they were trying to understand what are the limitations or difficulties of the process layout. So, the process layout had some advantages and also had some disadvantages. The main advantage of the process layout or the functional layout is the focus on utilization of resources. Similar resources were pooled into a single area. I had mentioned for example, there could be an area that comprises of all lathes, all drilling machines. So, similar resources were pooled into an area and products, parts and components requiring these machines came and visited these areas. So, the main advantage was that of pooling synergy in the sense that when, when there is a requirement for this machine, the products came to that area and any one of them in principle could meet the requirement. So, the focus was largely on optimally utilizing the resources. The disadvantage perhaps was that the focus was more on a particular process that is happening in that area rather than on the overall product. So, if a particular product or component visited a department for a particular requirement, the ownership and responsibility of that department was only towards that particular process, which is a part of the overall product and there was not much of product ownership. Now, in addition the, the products as organizations expanded as volumes also increased machines were added and the it was quickly understood that the products move very large distances and that had to be reduced, because as products moved large distances the inventories were also on the increase. Quality suffered because the ownership was more on the process than on the product. Setup times and changeover times on the machines were more largely because of the functional specialization. And if you take a particular function or a area, two or two or three products that are going to be machined on a particular on a on a particular machine, one after another, were not similar and required a lot of change over time. So, in terms of simple measurements such as setup times, quality, inventory and material movement, it was observed that the functional layout for batch manufacturing had 
a lot of difficulties and limitations. Now, because of all of these, the cost of manufacture was going up and time to manufacture was also increased. So, keeping that in mind, people started looking at now, if we have these two systems, now if we the, the advantage of this system is in control, because we said that there would be a line for a single product or more than one product depending on the requirement. There is unidirectional flow and each line is associated with a product or a set of products where there is ownership, set up times are less and so on. So, whatever are the disadvantages that people saw in the process layout, were actually the advantages of the line layout or product layout and whatever is the advantage of the line layout was a disadvantage in the process layout and what was the advantage of the process layout was a disadvantage in the line layout. Process layouts could show higher utilization of machines whereas, line layouts were unable to show higher utilization of machines. So, this issue came up can I get the best out of this line layout for this into the process layout and create a different kind of a layout from which I create a different kind of a manufacturing methodology which can get the best of both. Now, that thinking led to what is called group technology or cellular manufacture. Now, we will see about group technology and cellular manufacturing in much more detail as we move along. So, I would simply introduce two or three ideas at the moment and then expand these ideas as we move along in this course. So, group technology and cellular manufacturing the two terms are used interchangeably, though there are times people associate a few things with group technology and associate a few things with cellular manufacturing, but by and large these two terms are used interchangeably and mean the same thing. So, the fundamental idea is to reorganize the machines or group the machines and group the parts in such a manner that we have a group of machines, we have a group of parts. Now, we assign one group of parts to one group of machines or very rarely multiple group of parts to one group of machines such that all the requirements of the small subset of parts are met by this group of machines, which is a subset of the existing set of machines. So, the basic idea is for example, if I have some 50 machines and I am making some 200, 300 parts. Now, can I divide these 50 machines into 6 groups or 7 groups, each having about 8 machines or so. And can I divide these 300 parts into 6 groups, same number of groups each having roughly about 50 to 60 parts or 40 to 60 parts such that I can make all these 40 to 60 parts using these 8 machines. I can meet make another set of 40 to 60 parts using another 8 machines and so on rather than saying I am going to make all the 300 parts using 50 machines. So, when you have a system where all 300 parts are made using 50 machines it is large and complex. Whereas, if I can divide this into smaller groups and make them independent, it becomes simple and you could have more control. Now, that fits in with the ninth law that we saw here, which says combining, simplifying and eliminating can save time, money and effort. So, which is a very big gain. That is the reason I have also written led to principles like cellular manufacturing systems, JIT, etcetera. So, the focus is on reorganizing the machines, grouping of parts and once groups of parts are assigned to groups of machines, automatically ownership and responsibility for the product will increase, because the product or part or component I am using these terms interchangeably in this context. Now, the entire ownership of doing it rests with the machine group. So, the ownership and responsibility shifts from that of process to that of product. So, automatically quality increases, inventories come down, setup times come down. So, group technology cellular manufacturing was seen as a very logical way of trying to get the best out of these two 
and apply it in the context of middle volume, middle variety manufacture. So, this is the first thing that happened and if we go back to history, the very first idea started the concept started somewhere in the 1920s, but well after the 1960s people have been using this extensively and after 50 years today we find several companies using this even today and benefiting through the use of group technology and cellular manufacture. Now, around the same time the Toyota production systems or just in time manufacturing systems came. Now, the one could say that some of the ideas are similar and some of the ideas are different. The first basic idea in these Japanese management systems is produce what the customer wants. So, manufacturing systems moved from what were traditionally called push systems to what are called pull systems. In a push system, it was centered around a lot of forecasting, production planning, scheduling and the products were made and once the products were made, the products were sold. In a pull system, the products are made based on the demand, whereas in a push system, the products were made based on the forecast of the demand. So, more and more of production happened in pull systems based on the demand, which ties in with the idea that produce what the customer wants and what the customer is willing to buy. And once we start producing what the customer wants and customer wants to buy, one has to keep down or bring down the time to produce. And that was possible by reducing the setup times and changeover times if multiple products have to be made, because of which the production quantities came down and because of which the inventories came down. So, the basic idea was to produce in time, to produce in small quantities and to bring down the inventory. So, in addition to bringing down the inventory, they defined wastes. We are going to see later in this course very formal definition of wastes, but waste is defined as anything other than the minimum amount of effort required to carry out an action. So, once we start looking at all the things that happen in a manufacturing system and wherever we found that there is a waste, which means more effort is made to execute something, the emphasis shifted to reducing the waste. So, the primary idea of just in time manufacturing system is what is called waste reduction and waste elimination. Now, the Japanese management systems or Toyota production systems or just in time manufacturing system came in 1962. It is also in place for about 50 years and has been used extensively by several companies in Japan as well as all over the world. Much later, around since both these group technology as well as just in time systems came about the same time, people quickly understood that a combination of cellular manufacturing or group technology with just in time would help get better results and manufacturing companies started doing that. A combination of cellular manufacturing and some ideas from Kanban controlled manufacturing systems, which we will see a little later to reduce the inventory. Both of them essentially talk about inventory reduction also. So, it was possible to seamlessly merge and integrate both of them to get benefits. The automobile sector in particular has been immensely benefited by combining these two together. The successes in other types of manufacturing, discrete manufacturing or batch manufacturing is also seen when these two are combined. Then came an era of what is called flexible manufacturing systems. Now, flexible manufacturing systems came around the same time or slightly later in the 70s where the emphasis was a lot more on automation. So, high capacity and high capability machines were brought in and because of a lot of automation, it was possible to make a large variety of products at the same time high aggregate volume. Example, you normally do not get to see uh, automobile manufacturing happening with FMS completely or entirely. Whereas, if you see products 
which are smaller, which have far more variety, electronics goods in particular examples of cell phones, televisions and products which have lot of electronics in it, you would find that they are closer towards a flexible manufacturing idea or high automation manufacturing idea. Now, the accuracy and speed are two very, very important characteristics here. So, a flexible manufacturing system by definition is a network of computer controlled machines, where not only the machining and manufacturing, but also all the support functions are carried out using computers. And in many instances, material movement also happens through computer controlled systems. So, flexible manufacturing systems help in getting very high accuracy, ability to produce a very large aggregate volume, ability to produce a lot of variety, but the cost of installing and running a flexible manufacturing system is very high. Therefore, it becomes economical and usable in products with very large aggregate volumes and also involving a lot of variety. So, these three can be broadly called as three uh, aspects or areas in process improvement. Of course, synchronous manufacturing or theory of constraints which we will talk about, I have not listed it here, but we will list it in some other classification that can also be talked about as a process improvement. Now, we look at briefly we look at some methodologies based on human resources and other processes. Now, if you actually happen to see the manufacturing, how the product is made, now there are a set of machines and there is a layout where the manufacturing actually happens and the products come out. Now, this actual manufacturing is supported by manufacturing systems, examples are cellular manufacturing, Kanban control systems, flexible manufacturing etcetera, which are the heart. Now, around that we are going to have a lot of support systems, some of them are integral to the manufacturing itself, some of them are slightly on the periphery, but they also support. So, these support systems come in the form of human resources and processes related to human resources, information systems and so on. So, we will see them as we move along. So, total quality management came alongside total quality management has focus on people, employee empowerments. TQM is a separate area by itself closely related to manufacturing systems and management. TQM talks about how essentially people are empowered and people create quality both in the manufactured product as well as on support systems around manufacturing. Some examples could be involvement of the operators themselves in handling day to day issues such as formation of quality circles and so on. Essentially on focusing on people who make the product and focusing on employee empowerment. This also fits in to one of the definitions in the requirements of manufacturing, where towards the end we say that keep the workforce contented. You keep the workforce contented by empowering them and by making them an integral part of the manufacturing system. So, TQM essentially looks at that. Now, alongside TQM, we also had a methodology called business process reengineering, which came alongside TQM. BPR or business process reengineering is an example of radical and dramatic solutions to an issue. While TQM represented a slow bottom up approach, BPR was always on fast radical and top down approach. BPR has an important component which is the information system component. Now, several examples of business process reengineering could be given. Many times the business process re the business process reengineering which comes out of extensive usage of automation computers and so on, in a way takes away the human from that. But the reason I have classified TQM and BPR together is that they many times go together even though very conceptually they are two different things. 
several examples of BPR can be given. For example, an ATM machine is, is a very good example of business process reengineering. The ATM machine uh, did many things, one of which was it, it, it kind of took away the manual teller for certain number of operations and most importantly it changed the way by which we go to the bank to take money. Before the ATM machines were introduced or before the ATM machines were available 24 by 7, our visit to a bank to borrow money was restricted only to certain hours. Now, it changed the way people do something. The idea of a credit card which now tells us that we need not carry cash or a check book when we go and buy something. Now, earlier days when sometimes we would not even be sure of for how much money we are going to buy. So, one always either carried extra money and in some extreme situations would find himself or herself short of money that needs to be paid when we buy things. Now, credit card takes us away from that discomfort. So, business process reengineering is to try and look at a process and largely centered around automation, but then help make the process better. So, but even though BPR per se can be applied to various aspects of manufacturing, but it is not so much into manufacturing TQM is, but TQM and BPR indicate two different ways of approaching something. Now, as organizations move towards total quality management, they also move towards certifications and recognitions of systems in place, which led to organizations having several certifications such as ISO 9000, QS 9000 and so on. ISO 9000 is a certification given to an organization for creating and maintaining a quality management system. It is not given for a product it is given for an organization which has a process by which quality is maintained. So, ISO 9000 and other certifications were ways by which an organization told its customers as well as its competitors its commitment to quality and more importantly through that commitment their ability to expand their business and get more business and of course, their ability to convince and tell the customers that they have good systems in place. So, when you have good systems in place, you automatically go back and clean up your manufacturing system and manufacturing systems are able to provide products with good quality at shorter lead times and so on. The next set as I classify them come under what are called information systems and decisions. Now, that is one level of support to manufacturing, where we are going to talk of three things, which are materials re requirements planning, manufacturing resources planning, enterprise resources planning, supply chain management. We are not going to go very deep into all of these, we are only going to spend a few minutes on each one of them. Now, materials requirement planning as it first, first it was called as MRP, then it became manufacturing resources planning, which is MRP 2 also spoke about the bill of materials, lot sizing and so on. Now, the bill of materials is a structure where we relate the final product to its sub assemblies and its components. Now, traditionally before the advent of computerization, bill of materials were actually kept in notebooks and so on. And once computerization and information systems happened, it was easy to get consistency in the bill of materials. Once computerization came in, started off with payroll and then went into purchasing and all other activities and then it moved into manufacturing through the MRP, MRP softwares were developed. Now, along with that we had MRP 2 which is manufacturing resources planning, where the resources required to carry out were also put into the software to provide support to manufacturing. Now, computers providing support to manufacturing is a very integral part of what is happening today. If you go back to the last lecture, there was one particular slide which spoke about certain events in history, where I tried to trace the combination of the advent of computers 
and fields such as operations research and decision making, which together help manufacturing organizations make very good decisions on optimal usage of resources. So, manufacturing support comes through these forms, they come through two forms, one is called information system and the other is called decision support systems. So, initially a lot of information systems happened, even today information systems are extremely important and are used. Now, they are used under what are called enterprise resources planning or ERP software, where the various functions in the organization are integrated. Though initially it started off as MRP and MRP 2, where certain specific functions were addressed using computers, helped in bill of materials and so on. Now, at this point it is also necessary to say that there are two ways of looking at ERP. There are a set of people who look at ERP as a logical extension of MRP, while there are a set of people who believe that ERP is a separate area by itself and should not be looked upon as a logical extension of MRP. Now, irrespective of how we look at it, what is important today is the existence of an information system or a computer support to manufacturing, which helps in good decisions, but primarily with good data, reliable and timely data, linking data coming from various sources and understanding the implication of a particular data or information on some other function and then helping in overall decision making. So, that is what these two areas do, which is ERP and MRP. Now, since the last 25 to 30 years, we have been talking of supply chain management, where supply chain management encompasses many things. There are four important things in supply chain management. Now, from a flow point of view, supply chain management talks of three things, procurement and purchase of materials, conversion of these purchased materials into manufactured products and distribution of these manufactured products along a network or a chain to the ultimate customer. So, in, in some way manufacturing is the central core of the supply chain, when we are talking of supply chain for products or manufactured products. So, supply chain management helps in integrating or in, in providing good decisions by combining the three activities of procurement, manufacture and distribution. Traditionally, these three were done separately. These three were done separately for multiple reasons, one of which was data, data dependability, data correctness and data availability and timeliness. Now, today with more and more information systems and ERP systems in place, today with more and more trust among different companies to share data, we look at ideas like vendor managed inventories and so on, as well as ability to pick up point of sale data, ability to pick up customer preference, all these things put together have helped us achieve and create a system, whereby the accurate data comes in and manufacturing now gets access to exactly what the customer wants and in what quantities. Now, another reason how all these could be integrated together is the fact that today the power and ability to solve large problems or large sized problems is very high. And therefore, when we integrate the three processes of procurement, manufacture and distribution and solve them as an integrated model or a problem, it is possible to economize further and reduce the cost further. So, supply chain management systems leverage largely again on gains in computers information technology and transportation, particularly in the logistics and distribution part. There is a core manufacturing component in supply chain management. So, this classification looks at from the information systems and decisions point of view, how computers and computer support helps manufacturing in meeting the requirements. It meets several requirements. If we go back to the requirements slide, one can go back and see how it helps. Keeping inventories low is a very primary gain in doing supply chain management. 
price can be reduced is another place where the effect of supply chain management is there and helps manufacture. So, if the primary thing is to keep inventories low and to reduce the price of the product, which in turn reduces the cost of making the product, supply chain management helps as a manufacturing support activity. Then we move to the last one, which we have business process reengineering. We talk of constraint management, synchronous manufacturing and the goal as well as agility. We will talk about these very briefly. I had mentioned about business process reengineering earlier as a radical and dramatic way to solve a problem. Let us spend a little bit of time on constraint management or synchronous manufacturing or theory of constraints or the goal. Now, this is an idea that was introduced by Eliyahu Goldratt in his first book called The Goal, which was published in 1983, where he in the form of a, a descriptive novel brought out the various issues in manufacturing. And much later the idea of or the area of synchronous manufacturing or theory of constraints was formulated. Now, there are seven basic principles of synchronous manufacturing and there are about five steps in the TOC decision making process. Now, these are very simple and commonsensical approach, which looks at essentially the physics of the manufacturing system or how the manufacturing systems behave and how through simple rules and simple means one can achieve a lot of control in manufacturing. Later, the idea of synchronous manufacturing and constraint management was also expanded as a solution to business problems rather than solutions to manufacturing problems alone. We will spend a little bit of time on constraint management in this course. So, the last of these points that we will see is what is called agility. The word agility has been in existence in manufacturing context for well over 25 years. There are several definitions of agility, different people have defined agility in different ways. There are times agile manufacturing is equated to lean manufacturing, there are times agile manufacturing is defined as something else, but by and large agility also talks about responsiveness, agility talks about ability to meet the customer requirements, agility talks about empowering the customer and help use customer ideas in decision making. Agility also talks about cooperate and compete in certain areas. For example, if there are two organizations, one let us say is strong in marketing and the other is strong in manufacturing. For example, if an organization can get uh, the marketing can get 2 x amount of business, where it can make only x amount of products and there is another organization which can get only x amount of business but it has the capability to make 2 x amount of product. Then if you bring them together, you could have a, a, a marketing which could get 3 x of the product and a manufacturing which gets 2 x 3 x of the products. So, they may be competitors, but it is possible for them to use their core skills to cooperate. Sometimes we have seen this happen amongst competing companies, particularly when they cooperate and get into a new product. Now, agility talks about all of that. Sometimes you can get into a new product, sometimes you can get into old products where you compete at the same time cooperate. So, agility is another uh, 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 methodology which has been used extensively. Some of these components are similar to other things like constraint management or quality management and so on. So, this kind of brings us to a classification that I have used where I have classified them on several perspectives. And amongst these perspectives, we would concentrate a lot on this particular thing called process improvement. We would concentrate a lot on group technology, cellular manufacturing, just in time systems, flexible manufacturing systems and synchronous manufacturing systems. From the next lectures, we will be doing that, but before I complete this lecture, we take one last look again at the ninth law in manufacturing, which says combining, simplifying and eliminating can save time, money and effort. If you see three out of the four methodologies that we are going to concentrate here, 
they all are based on the simple idea that you combine simplify and eliminate. Now, cellular manufacturing is simplification making smaller systems out of a larger systems. JIT is about eliminating waste. Synchronous manufacturing is also about simplifying and have very simple production rules. Flexible manufacturing to an extent does not come into this, but it also has its own way of simplifying particularly combining because it is going to exploit the power of the computer controlled systems to make manufacturing systems better. So, in the next lecture we will formally introduce cellular manufacturing and then proceed to understanding various algorithms and methods that are related to cellular manufacturing.